please join me in welcoming our uh, final speaker, Dr. Michael Millen. Okay, so thank you for having me here today. Uh, what I'm going to do is kind of approach the issue of multimodal data collection analysis um, through the lens, really, of clinical, uh, basically clinical utility. And I'm going to start off by just looking more broadly at imaging, not thinking about the specific modality, cutting across different ones, to look at the principles of what we're after as we try to think through what are the resources we need to really get to a point where we can reach clinical utility uh, for brain imaging. And then what I'll do is step into a bit of the Healthy Brain Network, which is a multimodal initiative uh, that I've been building over the last several years and still feels like a constant evolution. But I'll show some of the work happening there and the, the many, many modalities present. And it's really meant more to kind of help inspire next steps. But I'll show some initial uh, demonstrations. That said, I'm still in search of financial disclosures. Uh, so, okay, you know, when you look at publications like the one back in 2012 uh, from Tom Enzo as to why is it taking so long for biological psychiatry to develop clinical tests, it was really the start of a number of different publications asking this question uh, more broadly and then more modality specific. And, you know, back in 2018, uh, several of us put together uh, a paper basically giving a perspective on how can we get there which then, of course, now is, well, are we getting there? Uh, and, you know, it's an evolution of thought. But really, I think it does, this, it is an essential way, to, at least in my mindset, to approach the topic. So basically, I'm going to start off with the promises and what are we after. So as far as, again, is what we're after, and I'm a combination of child and adolescent psychiatrists as well as a neuroimaging researcher, it's, it's the same thing that folks have been after for decades now. Really, how do you bring about objective markers of, uh, of illness to help guide uh, practice, whether it be diagnosis, treatment decision-making, assessments of prognosis, eventually one-day prevention? Uh, that is, you know, the, that remains the holy grail that we're after. And, you know, over the last uh, several years, you've seen the emergence of RDoC and really the varying ideas of how to implement it, really with this idea that we need to redefine psychiatric nosology in terms of neuroscience, if we really do want to reach some of these goals, and really the question of maybe it's, maybe part of the problem is the over-reliance on DSM diagnoses and a nomenclature that's not biologically based. Then another part is really, you know, everyone's preference to go after the one modality that they care about most, as opposed to what you're seeing here, which is this idea of take a mass collection of different measures at different units of analysis and then go and start to guide your analyses and subtyping from there. And then, of course, what we're also seeing is, you know, the idea of precision medicine is just spread all throughout medicine. Uh, psychiatry arguably will be the hardest place for it to find a home uh, because we don't have objective biomarkers to guide any of the goals of precision medicine yet. But when we do reach that day, the idea is that on whatever range of measures we're using, we'll be able to sit there and for given subjects, stratify them, and, you know, basically say here is the likelihood of you having a positive response to this treatment or negative to that, and really start to actually use knowledge based upon varying biomarkers to, to guide the decision-making that clinician makes every day, which, frankly, right now when I treat patients, I often tell them there's a number of meds we can try, and this is a bit of a trial and error. So we're going to start with a good guess, and then we're going to go to the next. And, you know, usually it goes well, uh, but not always, and you always have to tell a person. There's limits to what we know up front, so we've got to work together to kind of explore it. That's not really the most in, enjoyable thing to say to a person. They're sitting there depressed or they're, you know, fidgeting through the roof or whatever else is going on, and you're having to acknowledge that we really don't know. And we try to find different historical things and so forth to guide us, and the, the truth is it, it's, there's still just not much knowledge. Another goal, of course, is the idea of guiding intervention. So here's just an example of of a paper that came out some years ago when uh, I had the uh, fortune of Alex Opus working with us, where we're in this case saying, okay, we could take resting state fMRI and have a framework that integrates that in biophysical modeling uh, in order to try to guide individualized, uh, you know, basically to say very specifically if you stimulate a particular area at holding the, the, the coil at a particular angle, 
what, what, is, what is it you're actually stimulating and not going with a one-size-fits-all approach. And this is just one example of the many uh, areas for innovation that exist with bringing imaging to bear and helping to guide uh, non-invasive treatments and invasive. And I mean, and frankly, in a number of ways, the guidance of interventions with imaging probably is in some ways the lower hanging fruit. Once the interventions are, are further refined, this is something we know we can map functional networks and we know there's a number of ways to improve the way we do it, but, but that is the, probably the lower hanging fruit. Still not easy. So the demonstrations of feasibility of, of all this, are, they, they are bound. Uh, this is back in 2012 in a paper that even back then we were able to sit there and identify a whole range of studies saying they were going to predict, uh, in this case, it was, these studies were all resting state functional connectivity studies, but folks trying to predict diagnosis and differentiate groups and so forth. And, you know, the last decade is just an incredible number of these style studies. Uh, and I emphasize all of them are feasibility. I don't think anyone can argue that any of them should actually be used to guide clinical practice, and there's a whole range of reasons why some of which I'll, I'll hit on. And then, of course, the idea of growth charts and, and, and changing uh, the way we think about things with them. Once again, now, uh, dating back more than a decade, you're looking at imaging studies showing the idea that we can do brain age prediction and, you know, whether it be functional on the left, structural imaging on the right, you know, one way or another, it's, there's plenty of information there for us to work from. And but once again, demonstrations of the feasibility. Then in more recent years, uh, this work by uh, Sukun Hung, uh, a postdoc who works with me uh, back when he was at MNI. I had the fortune of collaborating with him and Boris Bernhardt, where what they did was they took the autism brain imaging data exchange data set, which was an openly available uh, imaging data set is uh, from uh, grassroots data sharing consortium. And what they did is they actually went through a process of taking a number of structural measures uh, and subtyping individuals based upon brain structure essentially using cortical thickness, uh, geodesic distance, intensity contrast surface area. And what was interesting is when they looked at relationships between the brain and behavior, what they found was if you didn't subtype the individuals, you couldn't get strong relationships between uh, brain imaging indices and in the ADOS, which is one of the key measures uh, used in research literature for assessing autism severity. But when they actually subtyped the individuals on the brain, they were actually able to find within those subtypes, uh, more meaningful relationships, which, you know, it's again, proof of principle, but it's an interesting one, an important one. And then, of course, on the functional side, you have uh, Connor Liston's work a couple of years back now, uh, which was in Nature Medicine, and this one here, again, going with the idea of biotyping and subtyping, in this case, based upon brain function, and showing uh, associations with differential response to intervention with, with PMS and depression. And then here's another paper uh, that was focused, in this case, now they're looking at schizophrenia and basically asking questions, or sorry, a psychosis, I should say, and we start to depression, and they're basically asking about functional impairment at a later interval based upon functional imaging patterns, uh, finding predictive value. Again, it's, it, these, these are all demonstrations that, okay, it, it's, it's possible it, that this can be achieved, of course, in any of these data sets, what you're seeing is a number of cross-validation approaches that, that are somewhat lenient, and even when you have independent replication data sets included, you always have to still have your cautions because of sampling strategy differences and so forth, and also, frankly, uh, when folks go and try to replicate most of the work to date, you don't really see replications coming about too easily, and there's a whole range of methods, oh, sorry, reasons as to why. So that brings us to what's going to take to make the vision a reality. Uh, I always warn whenever I make these parts of the talk, it always sounds like I'm so negative. I'm actually optimistic about where this is going, not in the next few years, but optimistic in the big picture. Uh, you know, it's still the same old thing, and I feel like this is something so many folks have been saying for years, yet you see so many of our behaviors don't quite follow this. First of all, is we need to establish, we need to meet established prerequisites for biomarkers. Uh, that one is kind of a no-brainer for me when approaching this from the medical side of the world, but I think I see a lot of folks approaching from other disciplines who don't think that they need to achieve, you know, for example, reliability, uh, or at least not evaluate it, and kind of have a tendency to move forward without really thinking about it. I know recently I was actually looking through RDOC uh, on the website there, you know, there's these, uh, there was workshops back in 2016 focused on behavioral tasks. 
and they're really, you know, they were trying to come up with recommendations for behavioral tasks for each of the domains. And it's interesting when you go through it; they have some excellent appendices at the end that list out all the tasks. And most of the tasks, the problem is, most of them have poor or un unknown reliability. But these are tasks that folks are having to choose from. So, and of course, a lot of these tasks then get adapted in some way to imaging, and then you watch the task fMRI literature struggle with issues of reliability, and some parts the imaging, and some parts probably the paradigm that they, that they adopted, which was never actually appropriately tested for its use. And you see this repeatedly, and it's something that I think in the imaging community, people are getting sensitive to, and I'll show some of that, and there actually is more of a conversation. But the ideas of reliability, accuracy, validity, uh, and then of course sensitivity, specificity, these are the key, and you will never see a lab test accomplished without meeting these criteria. It's not gonna happen. And then once you've done all that, you have to deal with widespread availability I know when you look at some, something like, like, like MEG, uh, there's benefits over EEG, but, but which one are you actually gonna see deployed around the world if it ever works? Not gonna be an MEG given that right now there are so few of them. And I know years ago I tried looking at having one placed in New York uh, when it first went to Child Mind, and when we researched it, we basically found out we couldn't have anything, any place close to us because of different issues about the environment, uh, you know, between the subways, buildings, everything else going on. You have to think about when you do come up with that test, how widespread available is it? One could look at MRI and say the same kind of questions about how easy is it going to be given the extra cost, extra burden, all that. These are all open questions. But, but these, this is what it is when we talk about what's going to be, you know, something that actually delivers in the long run. And then, of course, the confusions. And I think folks have gotten better and better at realizing that it's not about chasing significance levels. And, I know a human brain mapping, I see much more of a rejection of the thought that if you've hit POS in 0.05, then, then you, you're ready to run. It doesn't mean that there's not value for neuroscientific purposes, but as far as for any sort of applications purposes, there, there are just higher standards that need to be thought of. Uh, and, and that part there is, it, it, it's, it's a confusion I still see it quite commonly. And frankly, every time I see someone coming from a company trying to sit there and convince us that their product is something we should endorse, so often these, you, know, you see P less than 0.03 and they have some, some figure with uh, two little blobs of, of dots or you, usually it's an Excel bar graph and you're just thinking, oh my God. But, so the, but the, this is still the realities we struggle with. And so it is about setting the, the bar where it should be and also understanding that biomarkers, you know, once again, it's not about their scientific meaning. There is no best modality. It's just, are they useful or not? And it's great when we can understand what a biomarker means, but not necessarily a prerequisite. It just makes finding it easier, arguably. And then effect sizes, still the same old rules. You know, we need to achieve uh, more notable effect sizes, larger ones than what we typically see in, in studies for any of the modalities. If you look at this here, 1.5 is the unimpressive red bar, oh, sorry, red line which, you know, that's unimpressive. I'm joking about that because it's unimpressive. At the same time, 1.5 is really impressive compared to what we see. And from that perspective, one, you know, 1.5, if you look at something uh, like a screening test, 1.5 could be totally reasonable. And on the other hand, when we all talk about diagnosis, you're, you're now talking about a diagnostic tool, something more like an effect size of three. Uh, the, that, that, that's a high bar compared to where any of us are at, regardless of modality. And, you know, as far as reaching a high bar for cross-validation, once again, uh, it's leave one out is, is nice for a test of feasibility and so are, are your capables. But, but then you have to start raising that, that bar and actually going and meeting that higher level. And that's something that, that is still a challenge regardless of modality as well. So almost done with the negative part. <laughs> but, you know, the reality is the reproducibility crises. And this plagues, once again, across the board, uh, and it's always great to see figures like this. And, you know, neuroscience made table two, which made me feel better. It wasn't on table one. But, but you know, neuroscience, it, is, it does struggle from issues regards with, uh, related to statistical power. Uh, there's no questions about that. Uh, and, you know, I'd say human brain mapping uh, had the Kabitas report some years ago, which I thought was a significant step forward is trying to help organize a community and really get a community thinking about reproducibility. Uh, and, and in, you know, one of the important figures, sorry, one of the important tables uh, that's overlooked in that report actually goes through the many different levels of, of reliability or stability in the finding findings. And it's, it's actually really key to think through when you're saying that you reproduce something, 
at what level. There are many different levels, and, and the bar really, you know, it, it gets to, to really say you have the highest levels of reproducibility is quite challenging. Uh, you know, at that point, you're talking about having completely different data acquisitions carried out in different hands, not coordinated, to be analyzed uh, in completely different hands and, and reproduce. It, it's that, that, that's more than what we typically see. The reason why all this is important is as we really step forward and try to talk about advancing agendas, including the multimodal, you need to, to, to have all this in mind because otherwise it, it can easily burn a person, a researcher should say. So key elements to, to resolving all this, the properly powered study one is what everyone likes to always point out, and it's true, but then comes everything else, you know, having reliable image processing, analysis, optimization, uh, you know, thinking about optimizing for reliability and validity, uh, standardization across the board, issues related to having common data elements, acquisition protocols, data formats, image processing. You know, and, and as you think about this, and then you start thinking, now I'm going to do this with multiple modalities, the challenge is every modality you have a high level of, spec you know, there's a lot of modality specific knowledge and expertise. And getting folks who can actually cut across the multiple is challenging. And so that often requires then collaboration and often a lot of trust, you know, when folks uh, hand you something, say I pre-processed it and it's the best w possible way you could process this modality, is that true? You, you don't know, you have to trust that and sometimes it is and sometimes you find out that, that no, that's not the case. Uh, and then of course comes the whole issues related to open science, the idea of data sharing, uh, of the idea of tool sharing uh, and actually facilitating transparency. Now one thing that I do want to point out, which especially as we talk about more challenging acquisitions, which I think about a lot nowadays because we are trying to get more and more modalities, is how many subjects do you need? So here's a, a, a figure from a paper, uh, or really a, a commentary in Nature Human Behavior that we put out in the last year, where, uh, and I credit Ting Zhu for this, for this depiction of the point we were trying to make, on, on the x-axis you're seeing reliability and on the y-axis what you're seeing is effect size. And, uh, what you're seeing, you know, as far as the values plotted or the color intensities is number of subjects required to achieve a power of 0.8. And the point of, of this figure is pretty simple. It's, it's the idea that in order to, you know, for a given effect size, it, it, the number of subjects you're going to need is heavily dependent upon the reliability of your data. And a lot of times when folks think about, it's interesting in grants, you often see folks don't separate reliability uh, from the effect of uh, effect, you know, from the measured effect size often. And so they'll just, you know, think about a smaller effect size. But the reality is there's some true effect size you're after. And when you're trying to capture that, what your reliability is will absolutely determine how large a sample you need. So it's not just about building bigger and bigger. And I know a lot of my career is based on saying we need large samples. And, and we do, we do need large ones. But, but we, we can't make up for the issues related to reliability. And the reason why that's so important is you could build your sample really large, but what happens when you're trying to make predictions about the individual? How is that going to fare when the data for an individual is, is highly noisy? You don't have reliable measures. So you're making up for it with these really large samples, but it's going to limit what you're doing. And that is a key issue that I, I think, you know, all of us who think about larger samples and want to rush to that jump to. And, you know, we need larger samples. That's not a question. But, but the thing is, we need to think about other factors, and that, that is a huge issue. And, you know, going to the multimodal part, as like nowadays, you know, I, I, over the last year or two, I've gotten very excited by some of uh, Scott McKee's work where, you know, his writings about mobile lab and the whole idea of mobile brain imaging or, or, or laboratories and so forth, where you sit there and you have a person who is doing an EEG test, you have an eye tracker, you have uh, motion capture going, you're, you're putting, uh, a skin response on, maybe you have an EMG going. That takes a lot of time to set up. These data acquisitions become more challenging. And so as you do try to get more modalities and think about putting the pieces together, it becomes a, a more challenging. You have to think of the, it, the data collection, the requirements of it are, you know, the, that bar goes up. And then, you know, this here is a chart uh, from back in 2013 when uh, Catman Craddock, Chao Ganyan, and myself spent hours arguing about all the known knowns and known unknowns and unknown knowns. You know, we kind of went down the way. And the thing is, whether you're looking at acquisition-related variability, experimental-related variability, environment-related variation, 
uh, or participant related, you're never going to control everything. And th this is a challenge when we think about reliability and measurement. And a lot of times people will tell me they absolutely have everything locked down in their protocol, and I kind of scratch my head and say, and that's probably not as true as you want it to be. Uh, and the, the reason why it matters is, is, you know, what we're trying to make, point we're trying to make here is a lot of what you have to do is really comes down to optimization of things actually into post-processing. You can have the best acquisition you, you can try to get, but you also need to balance it. And, you know, we have put a lot of time over the years in trying to figure out how do we optimize uh, image processing for reliability and so forth. And that, that's, it's still something that haunts us, you know, it always probably haunts us. Because every time we think we have something really cool and really excited, we usually find something in the processing that it might be dependent on or there's some artifact you have to worry about. Then when you're done with all that, the, the final piece, of course, is, is, is the sample you have representative. And that, that one's challenging. I mean, the epidemiologists have struggled with this for years and have a lot of ideas on how, how to help overcome these challenges. But it's something that it's part of, uh, of why when you look at reproducibility and so forth, a lot of times folks don't think of, even if you got everything else right, you might not be looking at the same population. You could be looking at different ends of pathology load in a population. You might have different socioeconomic character, uh, characteristics. There's so many things. And so that kind of big picture view I do think is required when we really start to talk about clinical applications and what, what the agenda is. Because, other, you know, there's the part that neuroscientifically makes good sense. You, need to you don't need to worry about all this. But then when you decide you're going to that next level, then it does become more of a concern. So are we getting there? So I would argue, yeah. So on the data aggregation sharing, sorry, as far as getting large uh, sample sizes, here's just examples of the indie efforts which myself and others have put together over the years for helping increase sample sizes and, and, and make sure that everyone at least has some minimally large data set to, to be using. And then, of course, there are all the many data resource generation initiatives that are out there, uh, which as each one comes to bear, I start hearing folks saying maybe we should stop generating data, which there's a part of me that's like, no, that's not the answer. Uh, but, but, you know, the thing is we do have a lot more data to work with. On the flip side, I could tell you, like, for things like the Healthy Brain Network, right now we're about 3,600 subjects in, target's 10,000. And, it, you know, you could very quickly have 10,000 subjects, in that case, ages 5 to 21, uh, with the vast majority affected by uh, mental health or learning disorders. But large data sets become small very quickly once you start talking about subtyping and homogeneity and all these things. So that, that's why when, when, when all this turns into someone saying, oh, we should stop collecting data, I, I, I usually am somewhat mortified. Should we standardize and other things? Yes. But stop collecting data? No. Uh, you know, you've seen an emergence of best practices and standards in the imaging community, which I think really is, is exciting. Uh, and, and the most obvious thing in recent years is BIDS. Uh, you know, there's, BIDS has really emerged as, as a way of trying to have a standardized uh, metadata format that actually is being extended into the broad range of modalities. And I, I think, it, you know, it's proven to be flexible and so forth. Uh, you know, and I think, you know, much credit to Chris Gorgolewski and Russ Poldrack, they, they've really inspired folks from that perspective. Uh, it, it really hasn't taken much to get the imaging community to jump on board and to watch the amount of grassroots efforts going on in order to just keep extending that format. So I think that has been a major step forward as well as some of the things like, like I mentioned earlier, there was Cobitas uh, helping with best practices and then there's varying articles about guidelines uh, for reporting and then you have NIPIPE, which is really intended to sit there and try to provide a common pipelining framework for varying uh, pipeline packages. Uh, you know, the ideas about uh, data papers. A lot, there's been so many, there's so much work done in the open science space to try to advance us towards reasonable goals. Uh, and then, of course, here's an example of reproducible analysis pipelines, and there, there are a number. Uh, the one I'm showing here is CPAC, which is one that we've put together over years, where CPAC stays heavily focused on functional connectomics. Uh, but one of the things about CPAC is it, it really is designed so that you could maintain configurability while also being reproducible. So you have an infrastructure that has a the config file. It allows you an incredible number of processing decisions if you want to make them. And it also is designed to let you actually, with very little effort, compare different pipeline strategies uh, and, and be reproducible. That is not an, an easy bar. And I know the alternative is to go with quick one-click pipelines, which is, are perfectly reasonable 
It's just that I think they serve different purposes. One is for give me something that works and will work robustly right now and with best knowledge available. The other is saying, you know what, things are constantly changing and there's so many nuances in the data and so forth. I want to be able to evaluate and, and, and really have the flexibility. In that case, you know, CPAC has its, has its virtues. Data cleaning, that there's just been across the board a number of efforts focused to really try to dump into many artifacts and that, that is essential and will remain essential. And, you know, one of the challenges, and I'll show this in just a minute, is when, when you know, certain modalities, in particular functional MRI, and especially those of us in resting state, we, you know, are just incredible targets for all the many artifacts one could bring to bear. Uh, on the other hand, those artifacts really often generalize across the board at varying levels. And, and really with any of these modalities, we need to be really careful and constantly self-checking ourselves. Uh, the resting state folks are very good at that. I think it's partially because everyone always points to us. But, but I think that kind of sometimes seemingly neurotic obsession with pre-processing and many decisions we make is essential. And then, of course, revisiting uh, statistical thresholds. Obviously, everyone has seen at least one, if not more, of these articles and, and you know, the varying concerns that, that arise. But once again, there, it's a healthy correction process. It's just that it, in maybe after six, for six months after any one of these articles comes out, you see a certain amount of anxiety in the air and then you hear things in study sections and so forth and then everyone comes down and adopts the, the, you know, the updated approaches. Uh, but it is part of the self-correcting aspects of science. So I'm going to harp on for a few minutes before going into the healthy brain network and the multimodal front is optimization. Uh, this issue of minimum data requirements for reliable findings, this is a big one. Uh, a lot of the resources that I was mentioning, and I'm using resting state as an example, it, it, you know, if you think about it for years, what's one of the cells on resting state? I only, you only need five minutes of data. You only need 10 minutes of data. And the reality is years ago when we first started looking at reliability ourselves, if you're looking at the frontal parietal network or default network, you're probably okay with that. You can do pretty well. You will have some nodes that will get, you know, quite impressive levels of reliability. But what folks have been realizing over the last, I'd say, four years or so is that in order to really be able to map out the functional connectome for an individual, you know, with high reliability for the broader range of connections in the brain, and this, again, I'm going to say applies to edgewise connectivity. There are lots of caveats and opportunities for improvement. But the reality is what you're seeing, starting with really once one looked at the Laumann paper back in 2015 using the Rexpodrax My Connectome data, you quickly sort of, oh boy, we need more data. You start seeing 25, 30 minutes being, you know, showing substantial advantages. And paper after paper seems to be pointing to that exact point, which obviously now there's a challenge because what's most of the data collected to date? Five to 10 minutes. So that means that, you know, don't think it doesn't mean everything that we have is garbage or anything like that. But what it does mean is it will be limited as far as being able to make the uh, predictions we want to at the individual level. And it will, will also cause us to need larger sample sizes than we might otherwise if we had more reliable data acquisition. Uh, this here on the left is a study that we had done back in 2017 where we had uh, 12 individuals who each sat through 12 sessions of, uh, of, of uh, four different, uh, each session basically had rest, inscapes, which was a computer animation, movie fMRI, and flanker task. And basically what, what I'm showing here is if you then design your analyses, so you have 120 minutes of each condition essentially. If you ask the question about reliability for 10, 20, 30 minutes of data, if you look down over there, what you're noticing is this is your histogram of intraclass correlation coefficients. At, at, each, at each increase, you're noticing that your ICCs are going to the right. That goes with this idea that, you know what, you probably need more data than the five to 10 minutes. I mean, if you think about five minutes, it would be to the left. Now, another key thing, though, is we did a hierarchical model up top where we asked about reliability of functional connectivity measures, edgewise connectivities. Uh, when you look at it from the perspective of, of, of what, what's my interstate, so my intercondition, you know, rest, movie, uh, inscapes, and so forth, what's my reliability between states as opposed to the variation associated with, with session, so just re repetition of a given scan. And what you see is your concern isn't really so much for most connections, the variations that, that you're getting uh, as a function of state. So I could scan you during rest, during movies, during uh, inscapes and get 
really highly, you know, the, the reliability between those states is quite high. Uh, it's, it's the short amount, it's, it's the amount of data you put in that, that, that's the issue here. So what's the take home of that? Well, I mean, for us the take home was start using movie fMRI a bit because that makes it more tolerable for folks. And, and also there's a whole range of new analyses you could do with it. And, and at the same time, also start thinking about combining. And so we were starting to play with that, with that idea. And then Elliot L. came out with really a beautiful demonstration of this with uh, their paper in this past year with the idea of general functional connectivity. And what they're showing you is on the left, resting state functional connectivity. On the right is general functional connectivity. So basically going across different types of functional MRI scans. And the bottom line is when you go from 5 to 10 to 20 to 30 to 40, you see the story playing out. We can achieve reliability, even for edgewise connections, which I would argue is the most, those are probably the most difficult to get as opposed to more process measures. I know Dardo a while back had a paper showing with things like functional connectivity density you could do way better. But the bottom line is we, is by increasing the data, require, the data use, we can actually dramatically improve reliability. There's a cost, so that means that you can't say, I, I only, it only is going to take five minutes, I have to dedicate more in a scan session, but if you think about it right now, what you're seeing is regardless, you know, when you think about task fMRI with the number of tax, task fMRI remains under for uh, reliability, the reality is there's older studies arguing you need longer scan acquisitions, more samples and so forth. Uh, and, and, you know, it's the same story here. So we do have to buy in more to whatever modality we're choosing. And this was more, just some work from the Elliott study showing the values uh, as far as getting improve, improved uh, associations with variables of interest and so forth, with uh, the general functional connectivity measures, definitely paper worth looking at. And the one thing is, it, it's not just about resting state where the artifacts and reliability issues live. Uh, in the development literature, there's been this continuing story about motion and what degree are cortical thickness findings uh, impacted by head motion or other morphologic measures. So some of your brain development findings, to what degree is some of them reflecting actually motion? And one of the things that uh, recently there's a, there's right now a bio there's a preprint up on a bioarchive by Alex Franco. Basically, what we did in Healthy Brain Network is for hundreds of subjects, what we have is uh, basically a traditional HCP-like T1 scan and a T1 scan from the EBCD study, which has perspective motion correction. And basically what we find is on the one hand, the good thing is they're, they're you know, you get in low motion subjects, they're highly comparable, you, it doesn't really matter. But your higher motion subjects, you see the HCP scan is significantly compromised. And the reason why this matters so much for us is this all started with Nim Tottenham asking me in a longitudinal study if she should, she should switch scans or not. And what we found is if you look at it from a reliability perspective, switching from the traditional sequence to uh, a prospective motion correction scan, uh, corrected scan, you will actually have higher reliability than sticking with the same exact scan, which is impacted by motion, which makes sense if you think of what's bringing the, the, the reliability down. Well, it, it's the motion. And so one scan is, is more robust to it than the other. Still nothing's perfect, but the bottom line is, is when we went through all the analyses, it really did actually favor making the switch. And it, the thing is, if you're doing developmental imaging, you have to realize up front that it's just a reality of life. It's head motion, it's always going to be there, it's going to creep into your multiple measures. And just because you can't see it as cleanly in structural data, it doesn't mean it's not there. I will say the other reason why I personally have a strong investment, which you'll see when I, in the finishing parts of my talk, is because of the EG front. Uh, if, if fMRI were to fail on every subject, but I got a robust structural image, and that means those interested in source localization who would then take that structural image and be able to analyze EEG data in source space, I, I could live with that. I, I don't want that to happen. But the point is there's actually, a, you know, that structural scan is incredibly important, not just for fMRI, but for any of where the EEG field is going as far as looking at source space analysis. One thing that we're going to be trying out uh, in February uh, thanks to a supplement from NIDA, is we will be taking in case four, just these uh, from Jack Gallant uh, and others, where what they now have is you take a scan of an individual's head, uh, you, you send it off, and you get a fit uh, case of mold that comes back. And me and many others, when we first saw this, said, is that really going to work, kids? Jonathan Power has an initial study arguing that it does, and I know Kevin Craddock has been telling me for the last year about the successes he's been seeing with it down in Austin. 
So we're actually going to put this to the test in HBN, and that, that data we will be making available. Excuse me, HBN is collecting uh, more than 100 subjects a month. So we would very quickly have a large data set to evaluate just how well does it work or not. Okay, just one last thing, because I want to make sure I jump to the HBN and just talk about the multimodal part. This optimizations, uh, one thing is everything I spoke about score reliability is based on ICC, which is really based about the univariate. Now, what do you do with multimodal or, or even just a connectivity matrix? It's a, it's a multivariate question in a number of ways. So you need a multivariate li reliability or some equivalent index. So uh, Joshua Vogelstein, uh, when we challenged him with this idea years ago, came up with discriminability. There's a uh, paper on bioarchive that I would definitely point you to. But the idea of discriminability is it gives you a non-parametric uh, index for, for essential discriminability is similar to reliability. And you get, you, you get this index from a multivariate perspective. So you're basing it upon the full connectivity matrix, not just individual connections. Here what you're seeing actually is Joshua took uh, CPAC and wound up running a whole factorial of different uh, analytic options. And then he applied it to a test-retest consortium data. So what you're seeing there is uh, just a selection of 64 to pre-processing strategies with all the different test-retest data sets. And what emerges is you can say, what, what pre-processing strategies give me the highest reliabilities or discriminability, I should say. And it turns out GSR has advantages as well as, make, as, a, uh, which wrote, as, well as uh, passing through the ranks, which is a whole other correction issue for the data. But one of the things that's interesting and the reason why I draw attention to this is one of the claims of his method from a statistical perspective is that it, it, it's, it, it will be predictive of your performance of the broader range of tasks. So when we think of n pairs and frameworks that are really designed about optimizing your pre-processing for a specific prediction task, this measure here actually goes more broadly. And so when they went and did sex and age classification uh, or say regression in the case of age, you'll notice that discriminability actually outperformed uh, as far as explaining variations in, in the classification performance. Uh, so I would strongly recommend reading that paper. I'm going to, you know, just optimizing for predictions, another strategy. One thing I'm going to say before jumping to HBN and finishing up is there is one method. Now, this isn't quite multimodal as far as I'm not going between structural and functional. What we did here is we revisited brain age prediction, except we used Arnold Klein's mind boggle framework where you, come, you go and create some huge number of uh, features, which we were able to get them to pare down to having only like three or 400 features. Uh, but you know, they're, they're actually across cortical thickness and a range of other measures. And the, the, the thing was, if you know each one of these features is a different data type essentially, so if it's cortical thickness, if it's travel depth or so forth, well, they, what we did is we looked and um, Yihang Zhao suggested joint individual variance explaining analyses. It's a PCA extension that lets you identify multiple joint components as well as components that are specific to any of your data types. And what we wind up finding was, first of all, we took healthy brain network, 1,300 subjects, uh, the, ran the, the jive analysis on there. We also developed uh, age and sex classifiers on there. And then we took NKI Rothman, completely different data set, different acquisition, uh, same scanner, same PI, admittedly, but otherwise completely different recruitment to everything. And what we said is, first of all, what components are highly reproducible? And it turns out you wind up with some joint components which go across all the data types, but then you're seeing travel depth, cortical thickness, gray matter volumes, some set of specific components that actually have an incredible uh, correlation between these two samples, derived completely separately. And then, of course, there's all the other ones that you probably shouldn't be using. What's the end result of all this? Well, the end result is here what we're doing is training on HBN, predicting on NKI Rockland, and we basically find an advantage that comes through particularly for sex prediction by actually using uh, you know, the, the, this framework uh, that includes the joint components. Of course, the one thing you'll notice is global measures do way better. So just global gray, white, they, they actually are pretty good, though people often don't think about those. But this framework where you're, in this case, we treated uh, different morphologic measures as different data types. It could have been anything though. That, that's one of the values of this method. It was designed, uh, you know, for uses in genetics and elsewhere. So that this is something that's now published in their image, and I do think it's a potentially valuable approach. If you just done a traditional PCA 
and tried going through finding a component student of prediction, you would want to close to as well. We, we tried that and failed. Okay, so to finish up, I'm gonna go through what's the elephant in the room? Which modality? So first of all, does any modality meet all those different requirements? Probably not. That, that part's on, that we gotta be honest about. On the other hand, that just means each modality we need to keep optimizing, but we are at a point where how do you sit there and start to choose between modalities or create the links? You need to design data sets that actually include it all. So from that perspective, one of the things is here is just a quick little figure to just give the picture of the way the field works. This is Adrian DiMartino and Sook Jin Hong. They were looking at just 13 studies uh, focused on autism subtyping. And what you're seeing on the left is the measure they subtyped on, and on the right is what they're using for behavioral validation. So what you're noticing is, okay, so you have a few studies, you know, you have some handful that's using structural MRI, some using resting state, uh, others using behavior cognition. And if I went within any one of those categories, you'd see huge variation. And I know the reviewers were pushing on them on, you know, what's the mechanistic understanding you get from these subtyping studies. And when we looked at it, I, my, my comment to them was, how are you ever going to answer that question? Because there is none. Uh, you, you have folks using different modalities and within each modality different features. It, it can't work. Instead, what you need to do is start thinking about standardizing, start thinking about multimodal analyses, pulling the pieces from different modalities together and then repeating these analyses. That's why if you look at the UK Biobank, uh, Steve Smith and his imaging derived phenotypes and their recommended set, that was a very smart idea what they were doing. One might not like the specific phenotypes for one reason or another, but they were coming up with a whole range of features, crossing modalities and using them. And I would argue that that was actually a smart move to do. Okay, so healthy brain network, as I've been mentioning, it's a large scale data acquisition. And so great, now he's got you know, thousands of subjects, range of diagnoses and so forth, but that's, that's not so exciting. What makes, I would argue, more exciting is the range of measures that we're getting on folks. We're getting EEG, we're getting uh, fMRI with a resting state as well as movie fMRI, diffusion imaging, morphometry obviously, getting actigraphy, getting high definition voice samples, uh, the, EM, the ecologic momentary assessments, round one didn't go so well, round two is gonna be very good. Uh, it's just six and tweaks, but that's gonna be rolled out shortly. We get uh, blood and, and saliva for, to help with genetic analyses, though admittedly right now those are just being stored. Uh, the, the blood is actually put into the NIMH NIM genetics repository. And then there's also a whole other range of phenotyping, fitness testing, uh, an incredible amount of, of data about the behaviors. And so this here, I would argue, does create opportunity. If you want to think about EEG and fMRI, you can do that. If you want to think about, you know, if there's more physiologic-based indices or, or lower, you know, things like voice and voice feature analysis to put the pieces together, this is the kind of framework that will let you do it. Uh, and, and, you know, just as far as, as some of the impact it's already had, you know, so Scott McKeegan and Arno Delorme, what they did is they saw it and they went and said, okay, can we take a thousand subjects, process it, and show that we could create a high throughput framework for EEG processing using a supercomputer that was sitting here in UCSD and, and make the resource available. Now, I would say that also you have folks like Pedro Valdez Sosa, uh, Lucas Parra, Nicholas Langer, all sitting there taking the data, and as well as Scott McKeegan, and working on source localization and really how do you deal with varying challenges of source localization, now in a data set where you have thousands of subjects at this point, and you also have the imaging data available for them, you could now ask a whole range of questions. And in my mind, that makes this exciting. Here's just some work that Lucas Parra is currently working on tying down where he has been trying to look at functional connectivity and networks defined uh, by not just the fMRI signal, but what if you use a different band from the EEG, and the thing is the networks are not so similar in formation. Now, one thing is you notice that the gamma is, is not there, and you know, a lot of ECOG work from years ago with Corey Keller was showing uh, and pointing to this issue, and also more recent works, that the high gamma and uh, the fluctuations in high gamma seem to be most relevant to the bold signal. You know, when he's already looking at age and sex and associations, uh, with the bands versus fMRI finding different patterns of, of, of you know, association with connectivity patterns, which is okay. I mean, it becomes other units of analysis with complementary information. Also, what they've been working on is one of the tricks from the imaging literature, the idea of fingerprinting, and can we go and fingerprint 
individuals, uh, you know, using data connectivity matrices derived from different bands. I should say all in source space. Uh, you could do this in sensor space, but source space has clear advantages. And, and now, so you, you can start playing the same games that the fMRI community has been playing with EEG, and they have a whole series of reliability analyses that I've probably tortured them over repeatedly, and also even issues about combining across different uh, states and so forth. And it, there's a whole rich range area for exploration here, and then combination with the fMRI, and really trying to figure out what's the most integrated picture we can come up, up with. Plus, what if you can find those links between fMRI and EEG that are clinically useful? Well, then you've just translated into EEG something that, that would you know, be a lot easier than to do with fMRI. One other thing with HBN is we put in movie fMRI, which uh, again, and, and movie EEG. Uh, the movie EEG credited to Lucas Parra, movie fMRI, uh, Tammy Vanderwall uh, basically writing me repeatedly over, you need to do more than just breath, and then Lucas showing me some of uh, uh, Hassan's work. And, the Simony 2016 paper, when I looked at this paper, it really changed my mind about a lot of things. And at the same time, we were doing the HBN serial scanning initiative that produced that O'Connor paper I was mentioning earlier showing reliability in different states. Well, all that data is openly available, by the way. But the reality is, if we could sit there and take movie fMRI, we A, can have longer data acquisition, B, the intrinsic signals that drive resting state are still there, and the, state differ the, the trait differences are fairly robust, so I'm not worried personally about corrupting them with, with, the, with, the, with having movie or other states. And at the same time, it opens up a whole other world of analysis, intersubject correlation, and all the many things that can be done with a movie. Uh, actually, in HBN, what we do is that last movie, the, the present, we actually have that at the end. And then as soon as folks get out, it's a very evocative movie. That's where we get the high fidelity voice recordings. And, and you know, it's, you know, once again, to try to help encourage people to make the link. And then actually now the presence also included in EEG. Uh, so you, you can have it, you know, you could get, uh, you could look at it and try to link between the two. And I will say the presence uh, also in some of the work I do with Charlie Schroeder, with a brain initial project we have that's being shown to neurosurgical patients with, inter, with intracranial recordings. And on and off, we've been showing it to non-human primates as well. <laughs> so, but why would you show it to non-human primates? Because you can now make links across species with the movies. And we've also using monkey movies that were provided by David Leopold as well. So, so you know, which, I mean, frankly, some of the other movies, the monkeys were not in, all that into. Uh, it's better probably to take monkey movies. Humans like watching more from what we've seen. But the bottom line is movie fMRI, you can link across ages, you can link across modalities and species. It makes a potentially powerful way to go. I'm just going to finish up with just one or two last things. I think I have a few minutes left. Perfect. Here's one thing where, as far as intersubject correlation in EEG, here's with a range of movies. And, you know, we were showing age effects. We produced in two different samples. The bottom line is the movie signals actually can be useful in probing developmental phenomena in the brain. Uh, and, you know, just once again, as far as multimodal, this is work by Lucas Power and others uh, looking at, at across EEG, ECOG and fMRI at the similarities and differences, uh, again, using naturalistic stimuli here. Uh, HBN also puts a focus on eye tracking. He, well, one of the things we have is folks do the classic symbol search task used in neuropsych world, except what you're seeing there is the eye tracking patterns associated with it, uh, which make it potentially exciting. And I will say there's also EEG on their head at the same time. Uh, Nicholas Langer has a paper in BioArchive that's a really interesting one that does multimodal analysis between EEG and eye tracking. It got, I would argue, somewhat inappropriately rejected, and they just haven't bothered to resubmit it yet. So uh, it's actually a very cool paper. So I would recommend on BioArchive taking a look at it. And then one other thing is, we, another thing that we have is, you know, we have eye tracking on, with the EEG setup. And so when the presence being shown there, what you're seeing on the left, is density of plots for fixations across subjects square controls, and on the right is autism. And no great surprise, given what's previously known and so forth, you're able to see differences in how consistently folks are uh, looking at key features as a function of diagnosis. This, once again, another valuable unit of analysis. And I will finish up by pointing out uh, that Steve Lacan, back in 2007, came up with peer predictive eye estimation regression. Uh, it, it was the idea that you could use the fMRI signal in the orbit and train up a, a regression model. 
so that with a very simple calibration screen, you can actually have a model that takes that signal and tells you at each repetition of the bold signal where the person is looking. And that's something that's really been a hidden gem for years. If you've seen Steve present, then you know it. And Cameron Craddock, who worked with Steve, put it in HBN. And then I eventually started complaining at Cameron about why is this here? Are you sure this even works? But then I got intrigued in it. There's a paper in cerebral cortex uh, where it works very well, actually. Uh, and, you know, a whole range of folks, including Steve, Cameron, uh, Alex Franco have gotten involved. And, you know, we, have, we provide eye tracking data showing, you know, validating what Steve had showed years ago. And also what you're seeing on the right in columns is subjects and, and time points in rows. I'm sorry, in, in rows of subjects, time points in columns. I, it's incredibly good at picking up consistent signals across subjects. One thing that will corrupt it is head motion. That, that, that's true of anything with imaging. But there's that, and right now we've been currently extending this to non-human primates. Uh, you know, it's still here. If your eye tracker is going to fail or not work, or you don't have one, you can at least use this in order to ensure information about compliance uh, during the fMRI scans. And there's probably a lot more signal in there that goes beyond that. Uh, but I don't want to overstate it until we prove that. But that is one other piece because then now you start getting the. You can see now a resource makes all the many pieces come together and also creates a ridiculous number of analytic challenges for folks to bite their teeth into, which that, that's where I find efforts like this really make a difference. And with that, I'm done. Thanks to everyone, of course. We have time for one brief question. Thank you very much. Um, maybe uh, you said something that uh, uh, I would challenge, which is the fact that in order to predict from EEG, you need to do source imaging. I think most of the systems that are predicting well EEG for or MEG are actually do as well using sensitive data without any source imaging. Uh, but for, for connectivity? Well, it depends what you want to predict. But uh, if uh, for pure predictions, uh, I would be happy to see how much you can improve on this. I, I would say that so far from what's in the data, because I know Lucas started more on the sensor connectivity part, and I know uh, watching Paige will come by and have many commentaries about it. Uh, over time, it does seem like higher reliability has been coming through as a story with the, with the source data. But that, that also could be, you know, there's lots of caveats there. So I, I think it's a matter of really doing rigorous analyses, which they've done some, but there's also obviously a number, whole range of different caveats about what model one's using for source localization and so forth. So I, and, and long number channel. I mean, there, there's a lot there. Yeah. So maybe there's something that you adjust, which is the electro locations that can be slightly different, so you can mm -hmm. compensate for that. Potentially. Yeah. That 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 fight I don't have a huge stake in, so. <laughs> But it's, uh, it is an important one. I mean, that's been, I'm in grad school, my, my, uh, my uh, qualifying exams, I had to make oral examinations on source localization techniques. Uh, but, you know, they've made so much progress over the years. But at the same time, you know, it, it's paying a lot on probably what measures one's using and, and how. I had a question. We had a, uh, a really good discussion yesterday about uh, biomarkers and, you know, uh, how multimodal could be used to sort of uh, bootstrap our sensitivity or 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 reproducibility, and and it was actually I, I found myself trying to sort of connect an argument of uh, you know there's many many papers that have come out with you know 20 subjects to 100 subjects that give kind of clear results you know C equals you know o, o one or whatever, um, but then have a sort of, pres of a pres prescription to actually connect those studies with, so how would that become a biomarker? I mean, just trying, you know, testing the replicability would be, would be good. I mean, how many subjects do you need? I mean, I'm trying to, I was trying to find a sort of a, an elegant way of saying the difference between those studies and true yeah. biomarkers. I think those studies are good at point, at, at hoping, you know, that's what I was saying. On the one hand, you don't need to have a mechanistic understanding or anything to go in the biomarker hunt. But at the same time, I think that folks who do have models and knowledge and it's more informed to do better. And from that perspective, I, I think those studies help us hone in on uh, at least the networks or features to, to be going after. You know, it, 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 it's like when, when you look at, at these meta-analyses, like so recently with, with some work I've been doing, they're looking at meta-analyses of mood and anxiety. 
and you know they're they're pretty clear as far as the range of phenomena that are at hand. But they, they they don't get you to the point of saying now here's a method on how to actually go and turn that into a biomarker. But it does hone your thinking. It does hone what you might target and how you might think to design your experiments to find that biomarker. So I, I, I'd say they're more of a guiding light, uh, and that, that's why I wouldn't overstate the negatives. But I, I just, when I see folks overstate the other, it's just mortifying at times.